This is the, the favorite, my most favorite part of the program, I gotta tell you. All this stuff, I love this shit. I really, I think this stuff is so incredible. When I called Brent Mishner, Mishler up on the phone, I said, one of those phone calls, I said, you don't know who I am, I just read the New York Times, and I saw you had this tree, which he should have shown a slide of, and then they, they had in the New York Times of the five branches. I said, that's incredible. You know, I would love you to come and talk at this conference. Of course, he didn't know what the conference was. I said, well, what department do you work at in, in Berkeley? He told me the department. I said, do you know Bob Full? He says, yeah, he works down the hall. I said, ask him about the conference. How many people heard Robert Full here? Remember the bug guy? Oh, my God. He just worked down the hall, so we told him that's why I came. Okay, Uwe Reinhardt. I've, where are you, Uwe? I'm, I know I'm pronouncing your name wrong. How is it pronounced? Uva. Uva. Oh, come on up, come on up. For years, people have told me this guy really is a terrific speaker. I tried to get him to come to my TED Med conferences, too. He blew me off. I did. Uh, yeah, you I did. Recall. You probably never got the letter. That's probably my wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but I finally got uh, through to him and, and, and got him uh, uh, to come, and I re really look forward to your talk. Bye -bye. Thank you. And it's a nice jacket, too. Thank it matches you. the chair. Look at that. That's <coughs> terrific. Yeah, it's uh, well, uh, I'm a little shy to come up here because we had a real doctor. And as you know, MDs define PhDs, which was what I have, doctors who cannot help you. Uh, <coughs> that's the first thing. <coughs> I do want to congratulate uh, Richard for these conferences. I had absolutely no idea. I've been in a lot of conferences, good ones too, worldwide. But I have to say, this is the most fantastic uh, experience I've ever had, and so I tip my hat to you, sir. The, I'm delighted and honored to be here. I also want to thank you, to, because to come on a Saturday to listen to an economist, that's in itself, uh, shows a certain geekdom that I don't even see in my <laughs> students. Because <coughs> economists are known to be people not sufficiently vivacious to be actuaries, and here I am. <coughs> Or as, as a student put on my door, this hurt, he says, an economist is like that man who can describe a thousand ways to make love, but he doesn't know any women. And that's sort of... <coughs> so here I am. Uh, I, being an East Coast uh, geek, I thought initially I was going to talk about American healthcare policy at the crossroads, retrospective and a search for a new paradigm. That's a perfect beltway talk. That's how we talk there. But then I noticed half of you are Californians and the other half are trying to look like Californians. <laughs> so I changed the title uh, into this. They're like totally weird 1990s in healthcare. <laughs> Whatever happened, man, and what next? And this is, of course, where medicine is mainly practiced nowadays in this uh, area. So if you look at different countries and how much they spend on health, we have, as you know, the best health system in the world. That's not a hypothesis, that's an axiom. And <coughs> the data show why that is so. We spend almost twice as much per year, per person, on health care than any other nation. And so therefore, when you talk to American, uh, Americans anywhere about healthcare, they beam with happiness. They think this is the greatest thing they ever had. Here's an example. There you go. <coughs> That's the attitude uh, you get. And here is a physician, how bad can cost containment get? And what troubles you is how academic medicine, and Keith, you should listen here, how academic medicine is not preparing students for the age of managed care, because every child would know this instrument won't work unless you pull the string tight. And, <laughs> uh, right? If you do it, it works. <laughs> now, how did this come about? You know, we know the Egyptians got hit with locusts because they maltreated the Hebrews. But physicians look at God and said, we never maltreated nobody. We treated patients, why managed care, which is the modern analog of locusts to them? <laughs> well, look at the social contract we wrote for healthcare that reigned till about 1990. 
Only the physician and his or her patient can decide how to treat a given illness. No one else should ever talk into that. Number two, no economic benefit cost calculus should ever enter a treatment decision. From which follows principle three, insured Americans should never experience rationing of any kind. I underlined insured because Arianna Huffington would remind us they're, the uninsured are exempt from principle number three. For them, uh, we do. There's 44 million of them. We do ration. Now, <clears throat> not since the fall from grace have humans ever, ex before the fall from grace, ever experienced so unconstrained an environment as we had it in medicine. And if you <clears throat> know, know the Bible, if you read Genesis, I forget which book, uh, three or four, eventually this ended, and so did American healthcare paradise. What happened is the footprints it left behind were simply intolerable. Here is health spending as a percent of GDP, 1970, 1980, 1990, and it was then forecast to be 20% by this year and 28% by the year 2010. That was the Congressional Budget Office forecast in June of 93. And that is a line that's really not sustainable. And this would come before the baby boom would arrive. In fact, I meant to talk here about the baby boom. I'm arguing that's not a big deal. For America, that's peanuts. That's problem number 13. But I think Horace Dietz already told you that. So I'm talking about the managed care crutch instead. Here is the baby boom tsunami, and of course we're all worried what this might uh, beget. Imagine uh, millions of Clinton-like creatures on Viagra <laughs> and having a right to it, because that'll probably be his last executive order, will be a patient's bill of right. Everyone is entitled to a dose of this stuff. What, what actually is a dose? Does anyone here know? What's a dose of Viagra? See, none of these people use it. Shows you a terrific audience. <laughs> Now, if you look again at this picture uh, and extrapolate the trend, I once did this on a Christmas card, and you could predict half the GDP. <laughs> I do a, my wife and I do a irreverent Christmas card every year, and this one predicted uh, at this trend, half the GDP would go to healthcare by the year 2050, and 90% by the year 2100. Uh, students ask, how could you run an economy? You could do this. You would have king-size beds from coast to coast, made by Mercedes-Benz, two MDs, two Americans with MD degrees in each bed, giving each other checkups all day long. <laughs> and at the end of the month, they would send each other bills, and an economist would add it up and say, there's your GDP. So it could have been done, uh, <laughs> but it didn't come about. There is, the late Herb Stein had a wonderful theorem that goes like this. If a trend cannot possibly persist, then it probably won't persist. <laughs> and that's actually a very powerful theorem. We economists like those. There's one in biology, you've probably heard it, like that. Uh, if your parents didn't have any children, you probably won't have any either. <laughs> and <clears throat> that, it's that kind of uh, theorem <clears throat> that we use to predict there will be a two by four. We said in the 1980s, we econ geeks, there'll be a two by four. We just don't know who's going to swing it. And it turns out it was private employers who swung it. But there were other uh, more troublesome questions. Do doctors in Minnesota or Oregon imperil their patients with shoddy care when the US Congress is fully prepared to pay for good care? And that, I'll show you some data. These are put together by Jack Wenberg at Dartmouth College and his associates. Medicare has the best database. Every doctor, patient, hospital patient contact is on a tape. So you can really estimate what people actually get in healthcare. And you can do it by county and relate it to all kinds of things. These data, you may notice, have actually been uh, cleaned up uh, for inter-county demographic differences, illness, and cost of practice. And what you find in 96, in Miami, Medicare, we the taxpayer, spent 7,000, about $8,000. In Tampa, the same kind of patient cost the society only 6,000. If you had wanted to balance the budget, you could have just dropped leaflets, say leave Miami, bomb it, move them to Tampa, you would have had a balanced budget uh, <laughs> just on that. Tallahassee is even cheaper. Baton Rouge, 7,700, New Orleans expensive, Shreveport, very cheap. 
although the same DNA structure, as far as I know. <laughs> New York City, here's the thing, and you can it's take home message, healthcare is more expensive in Baton Rouge than in New York City, and I know of nothing that's cheaper in New York City. Uh, here we go, Oregon, Minnesota, and Oregon. And so how is it that the best healthcare in the world costs twice as much as the best healthcare in the world? That's the metaphysical question <laughs> we have asked doctors. Now, I testify before Congress now and then, and I challenge the Congress, the Senate Finance Committee, you ought to have a hearing and have the Florida Medical Association and the Oregon Medical Association and just have a Starbucks conversation between those two and see how can the Florida guys defend what they do. My wife thinks this is completely unfair, and she made us, this was a Christmas card two years ago, for the holidays, a totally awesome scientific breakthrough. We had listened a lot to Monica. Uh, that like totally exonerates the United States. And here's her theory, and I want to ask Keith if he has a better one. Here's the thing. She believes Florida is balmy and warm, and the chromosomes, they grow very big uh, there. <laughs> and if you go to Minnesota, it's windswept and cold. Are there any Minnesotans here? There's none, so we can... They are? Oh, then we can't talk about them. But in any event, <laughs> the chromosomes, they are extremely small. So if you want to image a Floridian, you've got to do the upper torso and another scan for the bottom, two MRIs. You want to do that in Minnesota, you line up two Minnesotans, one hit. You've got to... <laughs> that is her theory, and you can see the title of her book is Congress Really Meshuggah. Meshuggah <laughs> is Chinese, and it means nuts. <clears throat> That's actually she uh, wearing a Russian tank commander's uniform because she knows it scares the hell out of me uh, <clears throat> when she does. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> and it works. <laughs> as, as Richard knows, it really works. <laughs> uh, now, the medical profession's inability to justify these differentials. And I always tell physicians, if you have a better theory than my wife's, email me that theory that can explain so far no email uh, that led to managed care because what happened is we lost faith in doctors to manage care for society as a whole and we hired gunslingers to do it for us but there was something even more disturbing and that was research on inappropriate care at uh, UCLA there's Bob Brook Mark Chasson used to be commissioner of health they did much research in the 80s, and I won't bore you with the details, but here's just one example of a whole fistful of such studies. Inappropriate coronary artery bypass surgery. They, they actually checked three, 400 patients, looked through the files, and clinical experts said actually only slightly more than half were unequivocally appropriate. Uh, another huge batch were judgment calls, but close to 20% all of the experts said should never have been done. That's not only expensive, but it's dangerous too, even with the modern uh, surgical tools. And there are zillions of studies of this nature. And recently the Institute of Medicine came out with a book, To Err is Human, but it was pitched off a study in the Journal of the American Medical Association, I think I remember correctly, December 21, 94, and there's a stunning passage in there it says the, the avoidable death through hospital errors, medication errors and others in the US is equivalent to two 747s crashing every day. Not every day, every three days. Let me not exaggerate. Two 747s every three days. More people die every year from avoidable error than the whole Vietnam uh, war had in uh, casualties. So <clears throat> this is a serious issue and as you know the Congress is finally moving on that. All of these numbers were known in the 80s and they led to this social response called managed care. It wasn't uh, unwarranted at all. Now, <clears throat> the trouble with managed care is it's about as precise a term as if I wanted to describe a schnauzer and I told you animal. Uh, that's about as... So I thought I'd make a slide to show it to you. Think of a Jones family. The Jones family would get a voucher, a defined contribution, from either government or an employer and top it off with their own money if they want particularly fancy kind of health care. The Jones family would have a choice of here I only fit two plans 
but hopefully five or six different kinds of insurance plans, and they could choose among them. And the managers of the plan uh, would control what the doctors and hospitals do, would literally supervise what doctors and hospitals do. That is what is managed care, actually what it really means, manage, managing care. It's really externally proctoring and intervening when you don't like what the doctor does. It looks like this in real life. All the doctors and hospitals would be in statistical fishbowls, and they're supposed to swim according to clinical practice guidelines. And if they don't swim the way you want them to, you go in there with a little net and flip them out like a dead fish. That is where the word network actually originated uh, in this thing. <laughs> That's managed care. Managed competition is something altogether different. It means plan A and plan B should be forced by the employer or the government to compete honestly and fairly for enrollees with full disclosure of data. And the way this is supposed to go is our government or employer would give us a fixed contribution, say $100 per member per month. And then we would have a choice of these six plans. If you prefer an expensive fee-for-service plan where you would get the kind of uh, wheelchairs we saw yesterday, you would have to pay this much on top of the premium. This plan might not get you that kind of wheelchair, and you would pay considerably less. In other words, some rationing by income class w there would be. And they are supposed to be, and this is for this audience particularly important, an information infrastructure on each health plan, we were supposed to uh, know the following. Here's the plan not to be confused with the doctors and the hospitals uh, in the plan. Here they go. Now, for each plan, we would know patient satisfaction, disenrollment rate, claims processing. How happy are you with the bureaucrats in the plan? And for each doctor and hospital, there would be a database that would tell us about clinical outcomes, predicted versus actual mortality, uh, immunization rates, patient satisfaction, background of physicians, and so on and so forth. And that does exist in Minnesota and ex exists in San Francisco, the Pacific Buyers Group. They have it, but mostly this does not exist. But that was the promise of managed care. Now, how did this get implemented? I always tell my students, policy analysis differs from implementation the person who invented the wheel, wheel was very smart. The person who invented the other three was the genius. <laughs> that is what it takes. I mean, an idea is very nice. This managed competition, which came from Paul Elwood and others, and Alan Enthoven, was, is a good concept on paper. It has never been tried anywhere else, and so far does not seem to be working. What happened really, there weren't these closed networks where you could actually hold a specific group of doctors and hospitals accountable for the patients in the plan. But every doc is in every plan, and every hospital is in every plan, and no plan can really be accountable for anything. We're actually morphing back to the old Blue Cross, who, where everyone, they're just bill payer and no longer care manager. Still, when you look what happened, I listened yesterday to Joel Katz, you're supposed to divide by per capita and constant dollars. I did that last night, so you can see very nicely. Here's the trend line. In the 80s, we went a little above. Managed care got us a little below. We're back on the old track. We're back. It's basically over. However, instead of spending 20%, we're spending only 14% this year, which is $350 billion less than we would have spent. And in the year 2010, only 16 rather than 28. So there was an achievement, but it wasn't long lived. Now there is the backlash. You've uh, heard about it. The Clinton administration is having fun with that. And my argument is even Mother Teresa would have triggered a backlash because ultimately what managed care meant is taking Americans out of paradise and making them feel limits. You can't have this. You must contribute to your, you tell doctors you can't bill as you like. Of course, everyone uh, was angry. But then, in addition, the managed care people behaved like a bunch of klutzes, there's no doubt. Uh, they came into town swashbuckling, shooting up everyone, chasing doctors and uh, hospitals. Here's a very interesting one. They had the idea, mainly men, had the great idea that mothers should be discharged from the hospital one day after a normal delivery and two after a C-section. 
Now, maybe that's clinically safe, but remember they were supposed to be consumers, and if the ladies wanted to stay, they could have stayed. And it says here that they expect to save $1,000 to $2,000 per day for kicking a mother out of bed on the second day. Now, we got too many hospitals in America. Go to any town, that's what it looks like. And all our, our hospitals are half empty. So the real thing is, I ask this fundamental question. How much mu jello can a mother eat? Because that is the only cost that there would be on the second day. <laughs> I actually wrote a scholarly paper with this title because it's a very fundamental question. Uh, because that's all mothers do. They eat jello and feed the baby. The hospital puts almost nothing in it but the linen, and it ain't worth stealing. So there you go. Uh, <clears throat> Finally, the promised infrastructure never came about that we were promised. Americans now clamor for government to intervene. And here's my wife's. Again, she has a theorem, law of rugged individualism. When the going gets tough, the tough run to the government. That is, and he, I drew a picture, that's a picture of rugged individualism in America. I think running to the government is the wrong prescription. Now, <clears throat> Richard is standing up. Uh, the final thing that you should uh, consider, who is going to be uh, the information processor for all of these players? And I leave you, how it came down in the 90s was the employers went to bed with a health plan and stuck it to everyone else. That created a backlash, so they stick it to the HMO plans. And what we really need in the future uh, is the following thing. I ask, who will be the information broker? Someone in between who will do translate information for the households. For example, clinical literature for households or uh, <clears throat> for physicians and hospitals or data on health plans for the households or information on doctors and hospitals for the household. That whoever can do this, and I think a lot of dot-com companies could do that if no one else does it, Whoever can do that can make a lot of money and do well by doing good. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much.